today here with me is Chris Urmson. Chris is one of the world-leading pioneers in self-driving. He led the Google self-driving project for several years. Then in 2017, he co-founded his own self-driving company, Aurora, where he is the CEO. And actually, even before the modern commercial era of self-driving started, Chris first participated and then led the CMU team in the DARPA Autonomous Driving Challenges. Very few people on the planet have had a hand in as many advances in the field of autonomous driving as Chris. So great to have you on the podcast. Welcome, Chris. Well, thanks, Peter. Really, really enjoy the chance to be here. Thanks. Well, it's so good to have you. Um, I remember the first time I ran across well, not literally you, but but your name and, and your work was, uh, I was still a PhD student at the time. And I think maybe you were still a PhD student. Um, this was a DARPA Grand Challenge where CMU had one of the top entries in the competition. Uh, were you still a PhD student at the time? So for the first one, yeah, I, I was. The second one, I, I was special faculty, I think, or, or something like that. But So... This was the big desert race that kicked off the modern era of self-driving. And um, I'm really curious, as a PhD student, I remember back, back when I was a student at Stanford, Sebastian Thrun led the, led the Stanford team. And of course, you've worked with him a lot since. Um, I remember it was a, a long like, discussion in the beginning, like, you know, sh should he even enter, you know, this challenge? And, you know, a lot of back and forth, you know, I wonder what was it? What might have gone on in your side? How did you decide or, you know, were you maybe <laughs> requested to enter the team yeah. that was in the challenge? Yeah. So I was, I was a graduate student back, th back then, and I was um, working on a robot on a NASA project, actually, uh, to uh, go to deserts and kind of practice exploring for uh, for exploring science on other planets. And, you know, I worked on the, the kind of combination of perception and motion planning to make this thing drive. And we were out in the desert. Um, I think when, when I first heard about this down in Chile in the Atacama desert, which is just an amazing place. Um, and we had this robot driving there, uh, called Hyperion that was driving at about 30 centimeters a second. So, you know, picture somebody with a walker. Um, and that's about how fast we were going. And my PhD advisor, uh, Red Whitaker, came down and had heard about this DARPA Grand Challenge and said, we're going to make a, a Humvee drive across the desert at 50 miles per hour. Uh -huh. And, you know, and it, it just sounded really cool, uh, right? I, you know, I was excited about, you know, the idea of driving at high speeds. I was excited about, um, honestly, the competition part of it seemed like it would be fun, um, right? Uh, you know, the racing and yeah, it just seemed like an incredible opportunity to take some of what we had been doing and to, to take, you know, the broad swath of knowledge that had been built up in, in robotics over previous decades and try and bring that and, and focus it and try to get something that, that could really go do this thing that, that, you know, many, you know, it was called a grand challenge because a lot of us didn't believe that it really could be done. Certainly not in the 12 or 18 months or whatever it was that we actually had to, to put together a team and then actually solve the problem. Now, there were two desert races followed by an urban challenge. You were in it from the first desert race. And when you say it wasn't clear if it could be done, that first desert race it wasn't done, right? I mean, no, it, it it was spectacular, right? We we had been at the time, um, you know, I was a, a graduate student. We had a team, a bunch of undergraduate engineers. We'd um, kind of hacked together this retired military Humvee, um, right? It had been out at some farmer's yard, and he had decided he didn't want it anymore, and so we bought it and retrofitted it with motors and stuff. None of the fancy drive-by-wire interfaces that everybody gets to play with today. Um, and we had taken it out to northern uh, or uh, to Nevada to go test out by um, Carson City and all the old Pony Express Trail. And, you know, we had been out there and we um, we could never get anywhere close to 150 miles. And we figured, you know, 
to actually be able to complete the 150 mile race we were supposed to as part of the grand challenge, we had to do that. So uh, we started to put an emphasis on duration. Uh, about 10 days before the qualifying for this event, we were out at this dirt test track and we set off to go and drive the 150 miles, just basically in a thing of like a, a giant mile and a half oval. Uh, and we got the first lap out and everything was going pretty well and it was doing it at 30 miles per hour. Uh, and I being a super intelligent graduate student did the math and said, if we're doing 150 miles at 30 miles an hour, that'll take five hours. Whereas if we do 150 miles at 50 miles per hour, that'll take three hours. <laughs> that way we can get on to doing the other thing. So we should do that. And, um, you know, it, it, we sped it up, sped it up to, to 50. It went around a lap that was pretty good. And then the second lap, um, uh, well, it got into a little bit of soft soil off the side of the road, and we ended up an amazing team effort, pulled the thing back together, got it to to the qualification events that were down at um, you know a racetrack in in Southern California. I ended up qualifying first, uh, which was kind of shocking, um, and then we got to race day and you know did all the preparations we were supposed to, you know ran the checklists, uh, launched this thing, and it was it was an incredible moment, uh, right. That there was, you know, a grandstand full of people. We got to launch this thing off into the desert and it was kind of like, I imagine sending your, your child off to college, right. That, you know, you've been near this, this, this thing you've been putting your whole life into for months. And, you know, in this case, a year plus, uh, and it just goes off and drives into the desert and it was awe-inspiring and brilliant and amazing. Um, and, you know, you could, in our case, it was this big Humvee with an electrical box and a fin on the top. And so eventually you could just kind of see the fin over the, uh -huh. the, the sagebrush out in the desert uh, and the helicopters that the military had, you know, kind of filming it. Uh, and it went off, uh, it was supposed to drive 150 miles between um, uh, the Slash X Ranch in Southern California and just outside of Las Vegas from Nevada. Uh, and it got about seven and a half miles out in the desert. Uh, on its way there, it drove through three fence posts. Um, so we, there was room to improve. Uh, of course, the vehicle then, might have been good. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it was good that we had good that we had the big vehicles. What I say, because if it had been a smaller vehicle, <laughs> it, uh, it may not may not have made it. And then it gets uh, you know through a variety of reasons. Um, it ended up high centered on a berm on the side of the, this, this mountain pass. Uh, and it was, you know, people anthropomorphize robots. Uh, and in this case, it was one of the saddest things because, you know, it got high centered and stuck. And because we had the, you know, proportional control loop, it realized it wasn't moving. Uh, and so that meant it pressed the gas harder. Uh, and so the wheels on this Humvee were just spinning as fast as it, you know, the engine was revving at full speed. And, and because it was still slightly in touch, the wheels were grinding against the gravel, but not getting anywhere and melting the rubber. So there's this, it basically it was literally on fire, right? Uh, and then eventually the, the defense department who were out there chasing it said, okay, it's not getting anywhere. Um, and, and so they hit the kill switch. And an interesting fact about Humvees, unlike a conventional car, which has brakes out in the wheels, uh, there's actually a, a quarter shaft that comes in and then brakes. Uh, and so when it when they hit the brakes, those clamped down very quickly and just snapped the axles on the car uh, because of all the inertia in the wheel stand. So we had this poor thing that had driven out, kind of made history that day, but it was came back basically on fire, smoking with broken legs and, you know, and, and, but it was, it was an incredible day. Um, even though we were mightily disappointed with the outcome. In some sense, it's disappointing. But the other hand, I mean, it's never been done before it going in. I don't think anybody had any precise expectations on what the best team is going to achieve. Right. I, I think that's spot on. Right. And I think that, um, you know, the media obviously had fun with it, uh, right? Imagine uh, a marathon where the best runner goes two miles out into the field uh -huh. and then kind of collapses, right? Like, so um, so it was kind of like that. But in there, you know, in, uh, with, I think, I think it was actually really impressive the perspective the Defense Department took, DARPA took on this. And they said, you know, that day they said, this, is, this has been great, really exciting. 
come back, you know, a year from now and let's try it again. Uh, right. And they, they kind of saw the promise. They saw the energy. They saw how much this had captured the imagination um, of the folks that showed up. It was really, um, you know, it was a special event for those of us in, in robotics where we just had so many people come together and, you know, you know, it, it was, it was kind of like a, a conference, but very practical, which was, which was kind of fun about it. And what was your sentiment at the, in the moment? Were you like, yes, I want to do another one next year. I want to show them. Or were you like, I wish I can get back to my other research? No, I, I it was less want to show them. Uh, that, that was never it. Um, it was more like a sense that the, the, we weren't finished with the business, right? Like this was a thing we set out to do. Uh, in the moment, it was crushing. Uh, right. This is, this had been a lot of effort, and you know we were doing it on a shoestring budget. And um, you know, anytime you you face defeat, it's challenging. Uh, but it was really okay. We get to go do this again, and you know, and it was an incredible experience. Yeah, and so you now have the whole year to prepare for the second edition of the DARPA Grand Challenge, the Desert Race. How did that year go and, and how did that day go for you? It, it was special. So that year I got my PhD. Um, I got a job with a temporarily with a defense contractor uh, who basically made my job working on this challenge. We came back instead of having one Humvee, we brought two. So we had redundancy. Um, we, um, we really improved the quality of the driving of it. And um and then uh, entered the competition. Faithfully, Sebastian Thrun out of Stanford had uh, entered as well. Um, and, you know, it was, again, it was an incredible experience uh, to, to be part of a team that was so focused, um, really just wanted to make this work. Um, uh, and, you know, we were able to enter the competition our teams qualified first and third with the, the team from Stanford qualifying in the middle uh, between us. We um, we ended up, because we had two vehicles, we picked two different strategies. We set one to go a bit faster and, and one to go uh, a little bit slower and be a little more cautious. The one that we set to go faster was Highlander, our, our, our newest vehicle. Um, and it we unfortunately had rolled it about 10 days before the competition again, this time having actually out on a real course, having run you know, tens of miles. Um, uh, and, uh, and it was a, it was a really, it was an amazing day to see the vehicle set off into the field. It felt much more like, um, you had higher confidence that they were going to, to, to be success, right? They just, the vehicle seemed more capable, more competent. It was amazing. And watching throughout the day, um, as the different vehicles, you know, would come by the, the points, because this time, instead of it being, kind of from one point to another, they kind of wrap the course around the area where the, where the start was. And so you could see vehicles at different points in the day. And they had this map where they had the trackers of the vehicles projected on it. So you could see them. It was, it was really something special. Um, and then partway through the day, the, the, our vehicle Highlander, the one that we had said to go fastest, um, ran into a problem and, uh, it was related. We, we, we ultimately, maybe a decade later, kind of found what we think was the problem was a, a component that had been damaged uh, in the rollover that we didn't replace, just mm -hmm. cut power, caused there to be a power loss in the vehicle. And so this poor thing, this Humvee that can drive over incredible things was on this incredibly gentle slope rolling backwards uh, and because the power browned out on the vehicle. And it turned out we lost the primary sensing. Um, ultimately, the uh, it was paused the team from stanford passed it um and then they launched again and at the end of the day it actually made it all the way home which was an incredible honestly a testament to what the team had done in in making it uh reliable and robust but um long story short we had i think five vehicles finished the challenge that year which was mm -hmm. an amazing step from the year before um, the team from Stanford with some, some, you know, great friends with Sebastian, with Mike Montemurlo, mm -hmm. um, Henrik Dahlkamp, uh, Dirk, um, ended up, uh, winning that challenge that year. Uh, and then, you know, our teams came second and third, which was, you know, we were, we were obviously disappointed to come second and third, <laughs> uh, but, you know, incredibly excited about, um, about the progress and the, you know, and the, 
you know, it was just really close, right? It was, you know, in, in terms of timing through it. So, so I, I remember that that day. I mean, I think everybody in robotics was following along. I wasn't physically there. I mean, but everybody was following along and curious if even any vehicle could finish. And then five were able to complete it. And it was so interesting and so exciting to see, you know, robotics, which a lot of robotics research stays in the lab. And this is still a lab-like thing to, to yeah. raise in the desert, of course. But it, it felt like, you know, this, this is a bit of a coming of age moment where we're going to see these things maybe transition. Um, probably at the time we thought a bit sooner than, and thought maybe the problem might be a little easier than it has, has turned out. But we might see this transition into, you know, our own cars in the foreseeable future. And I remember then that DARPA set up another challenge, the urban one, where there's actually traffic and you're in, you have to negotiate uh, traffic situations. Um, and I remember you led the winning team on, on that one. Um, and so I'm really curious your experience on, on that challenge. You know, how did it feel fundamentally different from the previous one? And how did it launch what you're what you're doing now? Yeah, it, it really was, you know, this incredible series of, and, and energy that, again, I, I can't give enough credit to DARPA for catalyzing what's happened. Um, through through each of them, it became the experience became increasingly more professional. Right. The first one felt a little, you know, the most like Woodstock, right. And kind of just, you know, there were, there were, there was all kinds of different vehicles there. Um, you know, those of us who picked the Humvee, but some people make specialized vehicles for it. I remember, uh -huh. you know, there were ideas like somebody had a leaf blower on the front of their thing as I didn't think this was a great idea, but it was an interesting idea because if they could blow it with a leaf blower, then they'd know it was vegetation kind of thing. And, you know, it's just all kinds of stuff. Whereas, the second one became incrementally more professional. And then by the, the urban challenge, you know, everybody was using, um, you know, commercial vehicles. People were commercially available vehicles. People were partnering with auto manufacturers. And, you know, it was, there was that element of it. Um, it was a really interesting challenge because in the first two, it was really, can you stay on a, effectively stay on a trail. Um, in the third challenge, we had to stay on our side of the road. We had to deal with the other dynamic actors with, um, you know, they had stunt drivers come and drive vehicles around. We had to deal with dynamic road closures, potentially. Um, we had to, uh, at one point, deal with the part that, where there wasn't going to be a real map for, for where the vehicle had to drive. We had to discover the road itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was really... Uh, really exciting. I think it was. It's been neat to see the the impact of these um, these different programs on where we are today. So with the with the grand challenge, that was the first time we were really using HD mapping technology as mm -hmm. part of the the prior that we provided to the robot, and that's obviously mm -hmm. persisted through the approaches we take today. Um, in the second challenge, we started to see some of the early applications of machine learning to these mm -hmm. to these systems and, and that's carried forward with the the urban challenge uh more and more machine learning in the pro in, in the tools or in the vehicles um 3d lidar so instead of a single plane of lidar the velodyne lidar was was part of that that uh approach um, better cameras came online automotive radar started to become part of the toolkit we use and of course throughout all of this the available computation uh, on vehicles is ramped up. Uh, and so, um, and then the, the motivation evolved. So early on, it was how do we keep young men and women out of harm's way? How do we, you know, how do we enable the supply chains in the military to move safely? Um, to, to the, by the point where we got to the urban challenge, it was clear that there was a huge positive impact that we could have on transportation, on road safety, and just, you know, reinventing um, how people get around. And ultimately, that you know, the, that is what sprung uh, into the, the Google self-driving car program, now Waymo, and, and I think fed what, what's become the modern self-driving car uh, industry we see today. You led the Google self-driving car effort for many, many years. And well, in your words, it was the only game in town back then for self-driving. Um, 
But then at some point, you left. You started your own. I got, I got to ask you. Like, I mean, you were at the leading effort. You established the leading effort, and then you decided to start your own. So you must have had a kind of different vision from the Google slash Waymo vision of how this must come together, and hence want to start your own. I'm really curious. How is your vision different, and and you know, how does that you know map to today? So first, uh, again, I. I like I gave credit to DARPA for their vision and kicking this off, I can't give enough credit to, to Sergey and Larry for the vision of investing in this space, right? Back when people thought we were crazy, literally, uh, mm -hmm. that this could ever happen. Uh, and the opportunity I had at Google to work with amazing people to push this industry forward, this technology forward, um, you know, the privilege of leading that team was, you know, some of the best years of my life. Um, ultimately, uh, I got to a place where, um, you know, I just wasn't having an, you know, enough fun, uh, right? And that um, I, I disagreed with some of the things that we were doing. Um, and, uh, you know, it meant that I wasn't working at my best. Uh, and the company deserved better. The people that were, you know, I had 650 people or so reporting to me at the time, they deserved better. Um Larry and Sergey deserve better, right? And so it was time for me to to kind of uh, move out of the way and create space. And you know, we've seen you know what that team has done in the interim. Um, and so I left, and I didn't leave to start Aurora. I left because it was it was time to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I spent a few months trying to figure out what to go do next, and ultimately came to the conclusion there was a really exciting opportunity to bring together some great people with different experiences. Uh, to try and solve this problem uh, with kind of the, the next generation of thinking in the space. And it was one where we wanted to put um, partnership first, that if you think about the scale of transportation, it's gigantic. And that if you had one company that tried to do it all, it, it was hard to believe that we were going to get there quicker than working in partnership uh, with aligned interests with, with others. And that seemed like an important founding principle for us that having been a long way down the road in these different, uh, you know, from different places, we kind of had a sense of where, where did it feel like we were hitting dead ends? And if we could go back and do it again, where could we invest um, to, to avoid that? So we could actually get to something that would have commercial scale and, and thus the social and, and economic impacts that we're hoping for. Um, and, and so that's what we were, we set out to do with Aurora. We, we built a company with a mission to deliver the benefits of self-driving technology safely, quickly, and broadly. And, it's been um, it's been an incredible four and a half year journey so far. Yeah, very impressive. I mean, ultimately, I, mean, I want to get back to this later, culminating in you're announced to go public in 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 the near future. So it's it's quite a journey, four and a half years to to about to go public. But going back to some of the things you just said about working with partners, um, I'm really curious. Are you able to share some of the partner names and how you work with them? Yeah, so we, as we think about the the ecosystem of transportation around what we call the Aurora driver, which is that capability for the vehicles to drive, it's, you think of the folks who make vehicles, uh, and you think of the folks who use vehicles, and, and we see a world where um, we enable both of their businesses. So we work with, um, you know, PACCAR, uh, which makes Peterbilt and, Peterbilt and Kenworth trucks, and we work with Volvo trucks. Uh, and we work with Toyota um, and, and a few others on the vehicle manufacturer side. And, and these are these just incredible companies. It's easy in the Valley to kind of get into the mindset. This is the smartest place on earth. And boy, we iterate so quickly and, mm -hmm. you know, everyone else is, 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 is stupid. Right. And it turns out if you have a company that's been around for a hundred years, you know, that doesn't happen by chance. It means you're really good at what you do. Uh, and over that time period, you know, your processes, the way you work, who you hire, how the business, you know, evolves, you know, all of that's evolved to make you incredibly successful. Um, and so we feel like, why don't we work with, you know, the apex predator, if you will, in that space, right? Like, let's, let's actually be a partner with them um, uh, rather than trying to rediscover all those le lessons ourselves. Uh, and what they get out of it is, well, they've evolved in this particular direction, but that's not what it takes to to deliver a really important, complicated AI ML 
mixed software hardware product. Uh, and so we enable them to take that incredible resources they have, whether it's their ability to deliver vehicles or their ability to, to finance those vehicles or their ability to, you know, their, their network of service centers and allow them to take that and, and unleash it in a world that'll be transformed um, by automation uh, and have, you know, allow them to tap into to, to new opportunities, uh, new economic opportunities for them, new ways to serve their customers. And then for the companies that, that are using those vehicles to serve customers, um, let's talk about tra uh, transportation of freight. Um, there, we have a shortage of drivers. So today, the American, you know, American trucking, we're short 60,000 drivers. And by the end of the decade, we expect to be short 160,000 drivers. Uh, and as we talk to partners in that space, um, they just... They, they just need those drivers to grow and scale their business and serve their customers. And so what we're doing for them is providing them access to safe, reliable drivers that won't replace the drivers they have, but that will fill the need, the, the unmet need that they have. Uh, and I think that's really exciting because, you know, this logistic and transportation are the backbone of the economy and whatever we can do to make that safer, whatever we can do to make that more efficient and ultimately lower cost, um, will uh will raise all boats right it'll make all you know you know it'll create more jobs it'll make the the economy more effective and you know it'll it'll raise american competitiveness which i think is fantastic we are dropping new interviews every week so subscribe to the robot brains on whichever platform you listen to your podcasts one of the things that i think is really interesting in self-driving over recent years is that it seems a lot of the players have started to focus on trucks, highway driving. And in some way, I feel like it makes sense because highways are a bit more consistent than city traffic in terms of so the amount of variability encountered. At the same time, I mean, if a truck makes a mistake, the amount of mass it's carrying, I mean, the, the gravity, literally the gravity of the mistake is just so much bigger. So I'm curious. Yeah. You know about the trade-offs there and how do you think about getting autonomy into trucks and where are we i mean how, yeah. how close are we yeah and and you're spot on as we started the company we we began with light vehicles uh you know passenger cars and we did that for a few reasons um you know the the first was that uh you learn a lot more rapidly in urban driving. So if you think about a drive from San Francisco to LA down I-5, it takes about five hours. Uh, along the way, you're probably driving around the same six vehicles uh, and basically nothing happens. You know, and maybe something happens that's interesting once uh, through the whole trip. Mm -hmm. In contrast, if you drive you know, through San Francisco or even just Mountain View, you know, or where I live, something interesting happens probably every 30 seconds. Uh -huh. uh, and so if you think about the experience that you get as, a, as an engineering program, you think about the experiences you get and the data you can gather for the, the, the ML systems, it's just much more viable and, and much more valuable. So much more efficient. So that's why we, one of the reasons we focus there. The second is, is exactly what you talked about. Just you think about the kinetic energy involved uh, with these systems. And if you have two light vehicles, bump into each other at 25 miles per hour, you have a fender bender and everybody walks away. Um, a truck makes a mistake at high speed and it can be a very, a very rough day. And so early on, it makes more sense to be working at lower speeds with, with less energy in the system. And the third for us was we didn't think you could see far enough to solve the trucking problem, mm. right? We had always, from day one, we wanted the Aurora driver to be a platform that spanned passenger cars and trucking. We didn't know how to solve that problem. Um, and, you know, we, when I was at Google, we saw this as a limitation for why we were not going after highway driving early on. We just didn't believe we could see far enough. Um, and so this led us a, a couple of years ago to, well, during the first couple of years of the company for me to spend time uh, trying to find a way to unlock that capability. And, uh, and so ultimately we found this company in Bozeman, Montana with an incredible group of people who've been working on this really special kind of, uh, LIDAR frequency modulated continuous wave LIDAR, uh, that has a few really material benefits. One is because of the way it does measurement, which is a little different than kind of conventional pulse mm -hmm. LIDAR, we actually get a, a 10 to 20 fold amplification, which means we can use, um, the same amount of energy and see further, um, 
again, because we're looking at a, a an AC coupled system instead of a DC coupled system, we're much less um, um, uh, susceptible to noise and you know things like the sun or mm-hmm. um, halogen headlights blinding the the sensor. And then the third is we get to you exploit the Doppler. Um, uh, effect. So we can measure not just the location of points, but the speed of them, the radial speed of them as well. And that allows better reaction. Ultimately, we thought this technology would unlock the ability to see far enough so that you could, when you couple that with computer vision, when you couple that with some of the, the long range automotive radars, you'd actually get a robust sensing suite that would be sufficient to solve high speed driving. Uh, and so, 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 we've kind of tapped into that. And so now we've got a system, you know, we, we look at where we are with the Aurora driver, we've got the basic capabilities built up. Uh, we've got the ability to see far enough. And as we look at the economic opportunity, um, trucking feels like the right first application. Uh, part of it is what, you know, what you said, I characterize as, as we build a business, we can scale it through operations as opposed through technology. And it's, you know, a mile of freeway in Texas looks a lot like a mile of freeway in Arizona. It looks a lot like a mile of freeway in Minnesota. Um, right? And there's, there's much more kind of structure to that environment. So once you crack it in one place, you should be able to operationalize and scale it versus um, you take an intersection in San Francisco and you go five blocks away from there. And it's a different set of actors. It's a different set of behaviors. It's a different geometry. It's a different scene, right? And so you have to do much more technology scaling to build that business. And then you transform that from from San Francisco to um, Boston, and it's going to be all different again. Uh, and so we think that there's an operational uh, a, a, an advantage on the business side in trucking. There's a couple of other ba- advantages. So you know, if if I want to go to the movie theater from my house. Uh, I know how long it should take. There's a route that you should go down. Um, uh, and if I were to call an Uber to give me that trip and the driver took a different route and it got me there. So I missed the first, you know, 30 seconds of the next Marvel credits. Um, I'm going to be frustrated, right? Uh, because I know better. Whereas if I were to roll a toilet paper sat in the back of a truck, um, as long as I get to the destination within the couple of hours that I'm supposed to, I don't care, right? I'm, I'm not even conscious. Um, and so we can trade capabilities so that we maybe the truck drives on a route that we think is incrementally safer or incrementally easier to operate on. And we can take advantage of that when we're building our business early on, which I think is super valuable. And then finally, just economically, um, uh, we're providing a capability to drive vehicles and the value of that capability is higher in trucking than it is in moving people, right? It's, you know, truck driver gets paid about three times as much as a ride hailing driver. And so as we think about bringing a driver to market that, that works beside, you know, humans driving vehicles, there's just a bigger economic opportunity there. And early on, uh, our hardware will cost more because we won't have the benefits of scale. Uh, and so that economic opportunity, you know, that, that increased kind of um, value is, is meaningful to us. So this is super interesting, Chris, and it hits upon a lot of things that I want to double click on. Okay. One of them is um, when you think about operationalizing and building a business, it seems like there is the business of self-driving, like the, you know, pie in the sky, like it's just, it's just doing its thing. But there's also a business of safety systems, right? And I'm curious, is that somewhere you could also see yourself selling into? And is that maybe a way to bootstrap, to get more systems out, to just have a warning system or whatever it would be to make human driving much safer? Yeah, I, I think uh, these driver systems or automated driver systems, systems are awesome. Right, for collision mit- mitigation braking will reduce accidents and reduce cost to consumers and and improve safety. I think there's a big gap in the technologies, though, and and part of it is the market forces that are at play. Um, part of it is just a fundamental um, difference in requirements that uh, if if you're building a driver assistance system. Uh, there's you're ultimately assisting a driver uh, and that driver, it's going to be very difficult for you to understand their intent. So imagine I'm a, a super aggressive sporty driver that, that, you know, enjoys weaving through traffic down the one uh, and I'm willing, you know, I'm trying to cut in a really narrow gap. So I'm going to have to make a really aggressive um, move. And I'm going to have to get really close to the vehicle in front of me. Uh, a driver assistance system 
can't hit the brakes in that scenario because if they hit the brakes, I'm going to be confused. I'm not going to have as much traction from the tires because part of the friction circle is going to be used up for braking instead of steering. Mm -hmm. And it may actually cause an accident. Uh, whereas if I'm just a, a driver that's cruising along and, you know, tuned out because I'm reading my phone or something and in, in almost exactly the same scenario, I'd really want the driver systems to kick system to mm -hmm. kick in. So there's a limitation on how far we can push that technology because we don't understand the mind of the driver and its intent. Um, and, I, and that forces a bound on it. And it also, um, it, it's also really important in those systems that they are purely, um, uh, uh, well, that they have very low false, uh, false positive rates. Because if you're driving your high-end vehicle down the road and there's nothing around and it hits the brakes, that's right. really annoying. And if it does a second time, you get really upset. And if it does a third time, you take it back to the dealer and tell them, I don't want this piece of garbage. It hits the brake mm -hmm. on the freeway. And so as you engineer these systems, you engineer them to drive down the false positive rate to, to effectively zero. And you're willing to compromise on the false negative rate because there's a person behind the wheel who's supposed to be paying attention. And you might accept even a false negative rate as high as something like 50% of the time. Because even cutting out half of the accidents uh, that are happening on the road would be an incredible safety success. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, and so that'll push you in that kind of direction as a product. But that direction, you know, doesn't work for a vehicle that doesn't have a person behind the wheel. Because if, you know, I told you that um, your self-driving car will not hit half of the things on the road, uh -huh. uh, that'd be pretty unacceptable. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, anyway, that, that's how I think a little bit about that. Yeah, that's so interesting because essentially the way I'm internalizing that is that you're saying human in the loop systems are much more complex in many ways because humans are so complex and it might be faster to get to a fully autonomous system than a human in the loop complicated like management with, with the driver system. Well, I think I think you shoot for different different objectives. Really, is fundamentally. But yes, I, I think people are complicated, <laughs> uh, and and so where we can find ways to simplify the interface between the person and the automated vehicle or the the system, I think is is a huge win. Now, Chris, one of the well, I would say the big technology debates in self driving. Um, that you see play out on Twitter and so forth, but I'm sure also in internal discussions are in some sense the kind of Tesla style approach, which some others might follow too, but it's often characterized that way, which means um, cameras is all you need for sensing. Um, forget about the other sensing and um, no, no HD maps. And then on the other end, there is the HD maps can be can be very helpful, powerful, and additional sensing can be good. And and when I go back to, for example, when Andre Karpathy from Tesla was on the show, it, it wasn't like he said, "Oh, we should just throw out other sensing." I mean, why would you throw something out if if you can have it? But the way he phrased it, which I thought was kind of interesting, was, "I would much rather give up some sensing in return for scale." for solving AI problems. So this notion that if all you are gonna use is camera sensing, you can collect so much more data that the scale can compensate for the fact that you're only having cameras. And I'm really curious what your thoughts are on that as well as on the notion of using maps or not uh, yeah. when building these systems. So he's not wrong that scale matters. Uh, I totally, totally agree. I think there's very few things he's probably wrong about, but I think that there's, a challenge where, um, where if you don't have enough data, if you don't have the right data, it doesn't matter how much of it you have. So, so imagine a case where the argument was, you know, all you need is scale, um, and what we'll do with that means is we'll give you a single pixel camera, uh, uh, and we'll have that pointing forward. I would argue that you know we would all look at that and say there's just not enough information content there to solve the problem. Yeah, <laughs> uh, right. Um, and so let's go to two pixels. Well, probably still not an information enough information content. Uh, I think that f I think that the challenge is that yes, you want scale, you want thoughtful scale, um, and you, but you need to make sure there's enough information content in 
in the suite of sensor data that you're getting back to extract from it. And um, and so do I think in the long term that you can get there with a camera only system? Probably, right? There's kind of an existence proof people do this. Over time, um, we've seen lots of existence proofs of people do it that have turned out to, you know, like AI turns out to be harder than we first thought um, okay. in, in general. Um, you know, cars, we didn't look at, you know, horses and say they have legs and thus cars should have legs. We kind of used engineering to find uh, an, an advantage in putting wheels on vehicles, um, right? And I think the same is true here that, that, yes, we think that, you know, getting enough data, getting thoughtfully labeled precisely what you need data is, is super valuable, but you need to make sure that data has enough information content. And when I think about a, a relatively low resolution, low dynamic range camera, there's just a limit on how much signal you can extract. And it doesn't really bite you um, most of the time because most of the time the stuff you care about is kind of nearby um, and you get enough time to see it and the lighting's reasonably good. And so it works pretty well. Uh, the problem is that where you really have, um, you know, the, these kind of tragic events is, is these, these rare things. And a lot of time that move, when you're at speed, when you're dealing with something in the environment that you have to start reacting to, you know, a good distance out, you might be in, you know, bad conditions or whatnot. Uh, and there you need, you know, you need redundant sensing. I think um, you need this this complementary sensors that have complementary failure modes and limitations and advantages. I think the, you know, and this is kind of the hand wavy pseudo math argument here, uh, is that if you imagine building, um, let's say the the bar is we know how to build a three nine performance system, mm -hmm. uh, and you want to get to you know let's call it a six or seven nine system if for in terms of reliability and robustness. Well, building one three nine system, we know how to do that. Let's call that one unit of work. Mm -hmm. To get to a four nine system, to change that three nine to a four nine system, it's probably another order of magnitude of work to get it to a five nine. You know, let's say it's a, an order of magnitude work to go to add each nine. Um, so just to build that one system and make it uh, a six nine system is a thousand times harder. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you can kind of argue that the systems are independent then you can actually take three one nine or three three nine systems, put them next to each other. And it turns out that's three times as much work um, instead of a thousand times as much work. Uh, and that seems better to me, um, right? More likely to succeed, um, you know, substantially within the bounds of what we can do in terms of engineering. Now, you know, I'm hand waving because you have to assume orthogonal, or you have to assume the, 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 the failure modes are orthogonal and, you know, and, and they're not quite, so maybe it's one and a half times as much work instead of one, but, um, you know, it's, I think it's really important to, to not get wed to the, uh, the model that people do it this way. So that's that's the right answer. That's so interesting, the independence of, of failure modes. And it seems like part of that would be true because the sensing is orthogonal in terms of modality. But part of it could also not be true because if you collect yeah. the camera and LiDAR data, let's say, with the same vehicle, then they also encounter the, the same situations. And so there'll, yeah. there'll be some correlations in, in terms of what they can oh. learn. Yeah. And, and, and it's not, like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of intuitively, that's how we think about it. It's of course not completely orthogonal, you know, they're, you know, in the case of, of imagery and LIDAR, you know, they're both, you know, near optical frequencies of lights. There's going to be similar kind of filler modes. Like there are, there's a lot, they're, they're not completely orthogonal, but they're getting close, uh, which I think is meaningful. And how about the other thing that is often a, a big debate, which is whether or not to rely on maps and, and maybe the way I think about it is that is, is maps should help if you have maps, but if you rely on it and something changed yeah, and then you rely on the wrong thing, then maybe you would have been better off not relying on it. And so I'm really curious what you think. Yeah. I, I, and when it comes to safety, it's really a game of statistics. Uh, and so you're right. You, you need to be able to know when your map is wrong uh, so that you can stop relying on it or when it's sufficiently wrong that you should stop relying on it. But let's say the map is right 99% of the time, and that means that you can drive better because of it. 
Well, that's a really, that's, you know, two orders of magnitude of benefits you're getting there. So mm -hmm. you should exploit that. All right. You know, remember that we don't have really at scale any self-driving system. So early on, you know, let's use all the crutches we can. Let's actually get a technology into market. Let's actually start to build it and scale it. And then we can peel back places where, where we don't, don't need it. And I think, again, mapping, mapping is really leaning into what are computers good at, right? They're really good at storing information and they're really good at accessing it. So mm -hmm. instead of Instead of trying to force the tool that we're using, you know, computation uh, into our mental model of what you should do, why don't we lean into the the benefits that it brings and exploit those to get as much advantage as we possibly can? Mm -hmm. Of course, not sure how much you can dive into these details, but when I make my own mental model of something like this, I would imagine that you know, one, one way to design a system with a map is your system actually uses the map in a very traditional way and kind of locates against the map and steers against what it knows about the map. But another way to use it would be to more use it as auxiliary information where you have, you know, you have your gigantic neural network that looks at the world. And just like the world is an input, the map is an input. And during training, you can drop out the world or the map. And, it, you know, you, you can do drop out on all channels and build something that, you know, has the flexibility to deal with and you, you can even yeah. perturb the map during training and have, you know, things that are off now deliberately in, in training mode about the map and be robust to that. Yeah, I, I think that's so I, I can't. So one, I don't have the depth right now and what we're doing there exactly to speak is super, uh, super deeply with you. I think we are probably somewhere um, uh, in the middle. Like we, we don't use the map as um, kind of truth. It's certainly an input uh, into our system. Uh, I can't speak to exactly how far we're going down the kind of mm -hmm. um, enable and disable different inputs in, in part of the training pipeline. Now, at a, at a very high level zoomed out, one of the most, well, well, probably the biggest event happening to Aurora recently is the announcement of the SPAC to go public. Can you say a bit more about that? What went into that decision and what does this even mean to go public through a SPAC? Yeah. So, so it is, it's an exciting kind of next milestone for our company. Uh, it's, it's really, we look at it as a vehicle to bring the capital we need, the, the money we need into the company so that we can go and deliver on our mission. Uh, and it also creates the opportunity for, for public market investors to come along on this journey with us and be, and be part of the process. Um, as we, you know, last year, well, end of this, beginning of this year, we acquired Uber's self-driving car business. And, you know, mm -hmm. this incredible group of people are now at Aurora, awesome technology, great partnership with Uber. Um, we, we knew we were going to need to raise more capital because to, to pay for that as we, we went along the path to the product. And we evaluated different paths uh, to raise the capital we wanted to and ultimately came to the conclusion that uh, the entering the public markets was the right way to, to raise the, enough capital to get us through to, to being able to launch a product. Uh, and then it was a question of, um, is a SPAC the right vehicle or is an IPO the right vehicle or, or something else? And ultimately, we went with the SPAC path. Um, we saw the opportunity to, to be able to tell the story and, and bring incredible investors along with us. Some of the smartest folks in this space, uh, in, in the long-term growth space, things, folks like uh, Bailey Gifford and T. Rowe Price and Morgan Stanley Investment Management and mm -hmm. uh, CPP, like people who really think long-term, we're able to bring them in, align them with the company. Uh, and then we we the the SPAC company that we're merging with, the special purpose acquisition company, is reInvent Technology Partners, their their latest version of this. And Reed Hoffman, who has been a board member for us, amazing person, uh, also is on that side of it. And like any partnership, like any any deal, um, trust matters a lot and making sure you know the kind of people that you're going to be working with. And and he's someone and Michael and uh and Mark Pincus on the other side are, are folks that We've been able to, you know, they've been investors in the company since our Series B, mm -hmm. so that we know each other and have trust there, and and are, you know, felt like that was the right path for us uh, to be able to fund the business and to be able to, 
you know, take it um, in an appropriate way to the public markets. It's really exciting. Congratulations yeah. on, on, you know, making it there, even though there's still a very long way to go, it seems. Yeah, no. The, and, and part of it is to be transparent about that as we enter, right? Like we're clear, we have work to do, right? We've got an amazing technology base, an amazing team, amazing partnerships. We've got a path to market that makes sense. We've got to put the work in and we've got to continue to educate people about that. Um, but what we're playing for is so important, right? The ability to save an incredible number of lives, the ability to make transportation more equitable, more accessible, to reduce the cost of it, um, to provide transportation that you know is otherwise going underserved. Uh, and through all that to ultimately create an immense amount of value for our shareholders. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's exciting. Yeah, very exciting. And I think what it also means, it's kind of exciting to me, is you end up having to communicate more about the progress being made, milestones achieved in, in a more open way than as a private company. It'll be really fun to, uh, to follow yeah. along with that. Yeah, no, I, I look forward. We're going to be talking to people about the work we're making, uh, the progress we're making on on our safety case and sharing that so people can understand it, which you know is important. We're, we'll talk about the work we do with our, our manufacturing, our truck manufacturing, car manufacturing partners and how those vehicles programs are coming along. We'll talk about pilots we have with folks who are using mm-hmm. the Aurora driver. And of course, we'll talk about the cool technology we're building and, and mm-hmm. as, as that makes milestones. So yeah, it should be fun. And you know, it's it's a privilege, honestly, to... Um, to work with so many great people at the company and to be able to share what we're doing with with public market investors. Well, Chris, I can't wait to see what what comes next there. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast here. Oh, thanks, Peter. It's 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 wonderful to get a chance to chat with you. And, you know, I really, really enjoy your, your podcast. So thank you.